Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning at our first Grand Round, Sports Medicine Grand Rounds of 2023, covering bear implant for ACL restoration and recovery. We're really excited to bring this topic to you. Uh, the bear ACL procedure is something very innovative and new. And Dr. Rizzio, our keynote today will be, um, he's one of the first to perform this procedure in northern New Jersey, so we're very excited to hear from him. We're doing this procedure right here at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center, um, so we're going to get right to it. We have a really exciting panel today. Um, my name is Diana Toto. I'm the Administrative Director of Sports and Rehab Medicine. We want to welcome you on behalf of RWJ Barnabas Health. For those of you who are joining to earn credit today, uh, all our physicians that have joined us today will be offered one CME for attendance, and all our athletic trainers will be offered one CEU. Uh, please give us about one to two weeks to get those together and look for an email. We will send you out an email for a survey so that you can receive your certificate. Before we get started, we'd like to take some time to acknowledge our partners. RWJ Barnabas Health is the official health care provider for the New Jersey Devils, Rutgers University, Seton Hall University, Princeton University, Monmouth University, the Somerset Patriots, and the Jersey Shore Blue Claws. Blue Claws. We'd also like to recognize our preferred PT provider of JAG-1 Physical Therapy for optimal recovery with the bare implant. As we know, rehab is crucial for recovery. JAG-1 offers post-op care adhering to the bare implant rehab protocol, serving locations throughout New Jersey, New York, and PA. So without further ado, I'd like to jump right into announcing and introducing our speakers. We will start with our supportive panel. First, we'll start with Dr. Peter DeLuca. Dr. DeLuca is joining us here on behalf of the Musculoskeletal and Sports Medicine Institute. He is Chief of Sports Medicine here at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. He is a team orthopedic surgeon for the New Jersey Devils. He's also NHL co-chairman uh, on the research committee and former head team physician from the Philadelphia Eagles and the Philadelphia Flyers. Good morning, Dr. DeLuca. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Next, Thank we you. Have Dr. Good morning. Um, next, we have Dr. Jason Christofiak. Dr. Christofiak uh, is, sir, is uh, board certified in primary care sports medicine here at our Musculoskeletal Sports Institute. He's also medical director of our Morahan Center uh, for Athletes and our medical director of sports medicine here at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. He is assistant team physician for Rutgers Athletics and a clinical assistant professor for Rutgers RWJ Med School. Good morning, Dr. K. Next, we have Matt Kosh. Matt is the head athletic trainer joining us from New Jersey Institute of Technology. Matt had some hands-on experience with a recent bear uh, procedure that was done at NJIT with Dr. Rizzio. So, Matt, thanks for joining us with your expertise this morning. And last but not least, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Lu Louis Rizzio. Dr. Rizzio is a fellowship-trained sports medicine specialist and orthopedic surgeon who has been providing care for adult and pediatric athletes for over 20 years. He has experience with professional, college, high school, and recreational athletes. He has worked with local collegiate partners in New Jersey, including New Jersey Institute of Technology and Kane University. Dr. Rizzio is known for utilizing cutting-edge sports medicine surgical techniques to restore function. He specializes in arthroscopic surgery, shoulder and knee injuries, PRP and bone marrow, cell injections, cartilage repair and regeneration, as well as a variety of sports injuries. In a recent segment on NBC News, Dr. Rizzio was interviewed about the ACL repair technique utilizing the bare implant. He's the first orthopedic surgeon in northern New Jersey to perform this procedure. He's also a published author and has lectured on many sports-related topics and an affiliate of our RWJ Barnabas Health Medic Medical Group, as well as a part of our Musculoskeletal and Sports Medicine Institute. Dr. Rizzio, thank you so much for putting on this program today. Uh, thank you, Diane, and thank everybody. Thank you for everybody who... Uh, uh, joined today. Um, so we'll kind of get right into it. I mean, what we're looking at here is we're looking at uh, a new technique uh, to try to repair the ACL and restore uh, the ligament without performing a reconstruction. We'll go over some of the uh, basics of, uh, of, uh, of the procedure and uh, what the indications are uh, for, for having this procedure. So it's a little bit like back to the future here. Uh, you know, ACL repair was a, was a, an initial uh, procedure performed to, uh, to treat the ACL. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at where we are at the present, uh, where we've been in the past, and uh, hopefully where we're going in the future. So ACL injuries are common. Um, everybody who's 
uh, has children that play sports or have played sports themselves either, unfortunately, have had an injury, know someone that has had an injury, um, or has heard about it in the news multiple times. The, the incidence of ACL injuries is going up, and that's probably because of increased participation, year-round participation, number of times on the field, number of games played. Uh, alarmingly, we're seeing younger and younger athletes that are getting injured. Uh, when I did my training over 20 years ago, uh, a 12 or 13 year old with an ACL injury was a fairly uncommon event, uh, but that is getting more and more common. There's about 200,000 ACL surgeries performed every year. And in the last 20 years, there's been a three fold increase in the number of ACL surgeries in patients under 20 years old. Really, the goal of treatment is we want to restore stability. We want to return people back to their level of activity. And what we really hope to do is prevent or delay the onset of osteoarthritis. The current gold standard is a reconstruction. Um, it brings up the, uh, you know, um, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul analogy. We're taking, we're taking a tissue uh, or tendon from somewhere else in the person's body and we're creating a new ligament to try to reconstruct the old ligament. Uh, we could also take this from a donor or a cadaver graft as well. Um, and the procedure involves removing the, the native ACL or the person's own ligament and recreating that, uh, that structure. Some graft options, uh, uh, patellar tendon, hamstrings, uh, quadriceps tendon is gaining popularity as well. Those are your typical autograft options. Uh, allograft, which is donor tissue, there's, there's a variety of options that you can use for soft tissue reconstruction. Here's a little video just showing up. Sorry about that. It's a little video just trying to demonstrate what it is we do simply here. I mean, on the right, you see the torn ACL in the intercondylar notch. And on the left here, you see what we do is we remove the native ACL pretty much in its entirety to try to expose the uh, attachment site for the ACL, both on the femur and the tibia. Um, and in order to do this and see adequately and get the positioning correctly, we have to remove the ACL. And here you see the broad ACL attachment site on the femur and down here a little bit lower on the, uh, on the tibia. So it requires us to, to remove that structure in order to get the visualization we want. Once we've done that, we create sockets in the bone or tunnels. And you can see here, we're trying to put that socket or tunnel into the center of that ACL footprint. But as you can see, it's a circular tunnel. It doesn't reconstruct necessarily that oval shaped broad insertion of the ACL. And here you see a graft being pulled into the tunnel and being held by a button fixation device and some sutures. And then the goal is, is that this is going to heal to the tunnel, both on the top and the bottom, and it's going to re revascularize and repopulate with cells and become a new ACL. This is what it looks like when you have your finished product here. You have a new structure running from top to bottom, recreating the ACL uh, uh, positioning. So the real question is, is this a problem? Is this wrong? Are we, could we do something better? Um, why are we still looking for, uh, for a better option or a different option? We've been doing this for 30 years, um, but we're still, we're still trying to uh, enhance our, our results. And the reason is really is that an ACL reconstruction is not a slam dunk. It's not a home run. It, it's a great operation. It works very well, has a high success rate, but there is a repair rate. And then again, anybody who um, has had an ACL tear or knows people on their team that have had an ACL tear, retears are, are common, especially in younger active patients. And all too often, they have to have a revision surgery. Taking a graft from somewhere in the body is not without morbidity or some kind of uh, potential complications. The return to play of an AC after an ACL reconstruction is good, but it may not be as good as we thought it was. And is it really an anatomic reconstruction? Are we really restoring the ACL back to its normal anatomy? And one thing that's been talked about more recently is the loss of proprioception. And proprioception is your body's uh, position sense in space. It's sort of an unconscious reflex uh, 
sensation of where your body is in space. And the ACL has intraligamentous neural connections that provide some of that feedback to your brain. And that really gets lost when you, uh, when you do a reconstruction because you're removing the native ligament. Accepted failure rates run anywhere from three to 6%. Um, you know, studies are different, uh, but this is a fairly accepted failure rate. Um, and the failure rate is higher in younger active patients who participate in more sports. And even though the reconstruction may stay intact in 90, 95% of patients, on a clinical exam, there is about 25% uh, laxity. So people do still feel loose. There is some laxity on the exam in up to 25% of patients. And in one study, the, pre, the return to sports uh, and return to pre-injury activity was uh, not quite as high as we thought it was going to be. In this one study, it was as low as 55% of people returned back to competitive sports and only 65% returned to their pre-injury level. There's a lot of factors involved in that, but it's not quite as perfect as we thought it was. In terms of donor site morbidity, uh, taking a graft from your patellar tendon leads to anterior knee pain, um, up to 50% of patients, and that can persist for two years or more. Um, there is certainly a, a quad and hamstring weakness that does occur after removing this tissue. Um, clinically and in studies, it does not seem to be a significant finding, but patients do sometimes complain of feeling weak or having some loss of strength in these areas from removal of those tissues. And sensory deficits are common, particularly with a quadriceps uh, graft, or I'm sorry, a hamstrings graft, because of the location of the sensory nerves uh, to, the, uh, to the tendons that we need to harvest. So up to 80% of people will have some sensory loss around the knee. Uh, due to these uh, due to these graphs, and then proprioception uh, seems to be important in the development of arthritis. And this loss of proprioception and and our uh, lack of that sensation of where we are in space can lead to arthritis. And in some studies, it's up to 50% of people will develop arthritis in 10 to 20 years after suffering an ACL, even with a successful reconstruction. And in terms of being anatomic. You can see here that this is the insertion site of the ACL, both on the femur and the tibia. And the two colors here represent the fact that the ACL is a double bundle ligament. It has two distinct bands. And although we try to reconstruct this by placing the graft in the center of these two bands and making a new ligament and providing enough thickness and girth to reconstruct the ligament, we don't really restore this anatomy. Double bundle reconstructions have been attempted and tried for years. They've had some limited success, but again, not really any better clinically than doing a single bundle reconstruction. And it sort of uh, raises the question that even though we put two different graphs or two different tissues into this bundle, do we really restore that natural uh, anatomy and uh, rotational component of the bundles, even with a double bundle? And it doesn't appear that we do. So the question is, what, what other options do we have? Is there any other choices? So repair, everybody asks, can't you repair my ligaments? I mean, can, can't we just fix it, sew it together? And the answer is yes, we can. And this is an example of, a, of an early ACL repair that I have done um, prior to the FDA approval of the bare implant. And there are certain tears that have a propensity to, uh, to heal, and you can do this. But why aren't we doing it more? Well, the reason is, is that uh, traditionally throughout my training and my education, and, and I would say just about everyone I know, we've all been taught the same thing. The ACL doesn't heal. The ligament can't heal. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so, you know, it's been abandoned. And why doesn't it heal? The part of the uh, factors are there's intrinsic factors. It's felt that maybe the fibroblasts within the ACL tissue uh, don't have healing capacity. They don't do what they're supposed to do in order to get the two ends of the ligament to heal. In addition to that, it's environment. It's a uh, it's an intraarticular ligament. It's bathed in synovial fluid, and within this synovial fluid is a substance called plasmin, which interrupts clot formation, which is critical for healing. And you'll see in the MCL where it's an extraarticular ligament, and if a tear occurs, bleeding occurs. A hematoma, a clot forms, and this clot surrounds the ends of the ligaments, 
provides sort of a provisional callus or fixation um, and creates a provisional scaffold for the ligament to heal. The ACL doesn't have that option because the synovial fluid gets in between the ends of the ligament, uh, the plasmon disrupts the clot formation, the scaffold never forms, and the bridge between the two ends of the ligament never occurs. And you can see here, this is the ends of the ligament in an ACL. It's not many cells here, these round structures, and there's really not much of a connection throughout the healing process. As opposed to the MCL, you see a robust cellular response between the ends of the ligament and the scaffold, and that's because of the clot formation, which just does not seem to occur with the ACL. So the, the, real, the real thing is, is that the ACL, the cells, the cells do function. The fibroblast does migrate to the wound site. It does proliferate and make new cells. It does enhance vascularization and it does produce collagen. The problem is it can't form the scaffold. And so that missing piece right there really affects the ability of the ACL to heal on its own. And because of its synovial fluid environment, the cell, the fibroblasts within the ACL become less mobile, proliferate less, and don't move. Uh, to the site of the repair as quickly as they should. Then to put that together with the fact that there were a number of studies back in the 70s and 80s, which really put the nail in the coffin for ACL repairs, there was a tremendously high failure rate, uh, a high rate of instability, pain, and swelling after ACL repairs with sutures. And about this same time, reconstruction techniques were being developed and it was, it was largely abandoned because it was pretty clear early on that compared to a suture repair of the ACL, a reconstruction did much better early on. And in these early studies, every single tear was included. So if it was a tear from the uh, femur or a tear in the mid-stop uh, substance, they were all repaired. So we were comparing a little bit apples to oranges, but the overall sense was that this was not a viable procedure and it was abandoned for the last, you know, 30 years. But one little interesting piece of information, although Dr. Sherman here, I think in 1991 or so, uh, reported his results on ACL repair and they were pretty dismal as well, he was the only one or the first one to parse out the results based on tear location and he came up with a classification of tear location where he found that type one repairs or tears in the proximal portion near the femur had very good results and had much more reliable healing. And even though that was, that was noted in his paper, it was still felt that overall, uh, this wasn't a viable technique and a reconstruction should be, per, be performed. Sometime in the last 10 years, there was a renewed interest in ACL repairs and it was uh, partly due partly due to the identification of this subtype of tears that Dr. Sherman reported on, and also uh, newer techniques, newer uh, implants, and newer sutures available to us that we didn't have in the 70s and 80s. So one of the, uh, the things that became popular was starting to try to repair type one and type two tears only, and enhancing the repair with a device called an internal brace or a ligament augmentation device, which is a heavy braided suture that acts like uh, a fracture plate or a soft tissue plate across the repair site. And this provides added stability to the area while the ligament is healing. We didn't have this option available to us about 30 or 40 years ago. And with the addition of this, tech, this technique and this internal brace, we've seen improved healing rates. And although the repair rates were still up to 15%, in this subgroup of patients, this was a viable option and results were starting to be achieved. But the big problem was the repair was limited only to these two types of tears. A mid-substance tear does not work well with this technique. And there are still some things in terms of the biology that were missing that this technique didn't, didn't accomplish. The big thing is the lack of a scaffold. And there was, there was nothing, even though you put sutures in and you oppose the ends of the tissue, there was still no scaffolds for the cells to grow into. And even though you put the sutures in and you put the internal brace, you still could not provide um, clot formation um, in the ACL like you could in other ligaments. So this what led to the development of the bare implant, which is a collagen 
mesh implant that's about two centimeters or so, maybe a little longer, four centimeters. And it, uh, <clears throat> it allows for a scaffold or an ingrowth uh, to be uh, included in the repair. This graft or this uh, implant is also combined with a biologic uh, enhancement with either PRP, bone marrow, or a whole blood. But interestingly, in some studies, uh, basic science research, it seems that whole blood from a person or a patient uh, does better to stimulate the healing than either PRP and, or bone marrow, which is a little counterintuitive, but whole blood seems to work really well and in some cases, or in many cases, be better than these other, other factors, which makes the procedure even a little bit uh, simpler. So, you know, the feeling is, is that we've gotten to a point now where we've identified a subtype of tears that we can repair pro primarily, but it's limited. The bare implant gives us the ability to not only preserve the anatomy, it gives us the ability to provide a scaffold and a blood clot to wherever the ACL is torn. So we can really use this on a proximal tear, a mid-substance, and in some distal tears, as long as there's enough tissue here down at the bottom to put sutures in arthroscopically. So really the, the bare implant now combined with the newer techniques and the information we've learned throughout the years has provided us the ability to address all aspects of an ACL repair. We can suture the ligament now with better sutures, stronger sutures and provide stability. We can add a ligament augmentation device or an or a, uh, internal brace to reinforce the repair and provide mechanical stability during healing. But now we can also provide a blood clot. We can bridge the gap with this scaffold and we can give a template for the cells to grow into and reconnect. So a little bit of a schematic here of how this works. This is the bare implant. And what's going to happen is it's going to be soaked with blood and it's going to be put into the tear site. This is done after sutures are placed into the ligament stump. The sutures are connected top and bottom. The bare implant is connected to this construct with additional sutures. The patient's whole blood is soaked onto this implant. The implant stays between the torn edges. It creates a scaffold, provides uh, cellular enhancement of healing. And what we see over time is that this ACL ligament starts to become more normal looking as time passes with the repair. And this is an actual patient who had a, uh, a bare procedure and their native uh, ligament and the repaired ligament looked very similar at 24 months. So let's, uh, let's run through a, through a patient case here. These are some people that I've done uh, in the past eight or nine months. The uh, bare implant was uh, approved for use um, about a year or a little bit more ago. So in the first per person, this is a 20-year-old uh, male. He's a Division I track athlete. He uh, predominantly throws the javelin. And during one of these throws, he had kind of an unusual injury. His cleat caught in the ground while he was moving forward and went to throw. He suffered a pop and a twisting injury. Uh, within 24 hours, he developed significant swelling, and on exam, he had a grade three Lachman test indicative of an ACL tear. Um, MRI confirmed the ACL tear, and over here, what we see is this is the ligament here, and it's, you can see this white substance is the tear through the ligament, and it should really be attached up here. It's laying a little flat in the intercondylar notch, but the one interesting thing is with the use of MRI, uh, you can get a feel for how good the quality uh, ligament is. Is there good tissue here? Is there a good stump? Will this hold some sutures? And in my opinion, looking at this, the ligament has decent, normal, black appearing collagen fibers. It looks robust. It looks thick. Um, I felt that this would be able to handle some sutures. So we went ahead and did a bare repair about three to four weeks after his injury. And you can see here on the left, this is him six days seven days after surgery. These are the incisions. We have a small incision at the top for a mini arthrotomy to allow placement of the implant. We have an incision down at the bottom to fix the graft on the tibia. This is my scope portal. 
then we have uh, additional suture fixation on the femur through a small incision here. And, you know, maybe hard for you to tell, but I can tell you that at six days post-op, this is a very uh, minimally swollen knee here. This is not very swollen because of the lack of drilling bone tunnels and doing all that harvesting of graft. And six days after the surgery, he has excellent quadriceps control. He has excellent muscle function at six days after the surgery. This is him eight months throwing the javelin. And I think that what's important is here, the arrow is trying to show you, if you watch his left knee, that has to plant, twist, and pivot for him to throw the javelin. And he's eight months now, and this does not look like he's having any problem at all at the current time. In his exam, he has a stable, uh, a stable knee. So we're hoping that he's going to continue to have good success with this graft and go on to uh, to win a couple of a uh, couple of meets. Second person is a 17-year-old uh, male volleyball athlete in high school. Um, he's from Puerto Rico, and uh, what's interesting about that is he came to me specifically from Puerto Rico to have the uh, the bear implant. And I think that this is the power of of uh, the internet, power of social media, and the fact that patients are now looking for their own solutions and what's right for them. They researched the, uh, the bare implant. His sister had an ACL tear about five years earlier. She struggled with the post-operative course from her, uh, from her graft, her uh, uh, patellar tendon graft. She had a difficult time with it. Um, so the parents wanted to seek a different option. They found the bare implant. Uh, they found me and uh, came, from, came from Puerto Rico to have this done. So similar to the first patient, he landed from a jump, had a pop, swelling, grade three Lachman, and here's his MRI. And again, looking at the preoperative MRI, we can see a decent amount of ligament tissue here with, with decent amount of normal signal quality, and I felt it was reasonable to give him a chance at a repair. The one thing that was interesting about him, though, was that he had a fair amount of knee hyperextension bilaterally, which is indicative of generalized ligament laxity. So I was a little concerned about that fact. And so I did, in addition to the bear, I did an anterolateral ligament reconstruction to help restore some of that uh, uh, stability to the knee in people who have hyperlaxity. Hyperlaxity has been shown to be a possible cause of failure in primary ACL reconstructions. And the anterolateral ligament reconstruction is becoming a uh, somewhat recommended uh, procedure in addition to an ACL reconstruction in select patients. And in people who have hyperlaxity, significant rotational instability, I now do this procedure in addition to a reconstruction as well. So I provided that reconstruction with the, with the bare implant four to five weeks after surgery. And again, here's his incisions, bare implant, tibial fixation, and the femoral fixation here, I was able to use the same incision with a small incision here, tunneled underneath the skin to reconstruct the anterolateral ligament. Again, here he is seven to eight days post repair, very minimal, if any, swelling, excellent quant control. Now this is him six weeks post repair. I have to put the big disclaimer, I did not allow this. I, I never told him he could do this. Uh, but he sent me this video of how good he feels six weeks post-op. He's not even wearing a brace. He's got KT tape on. He's running around. He's shooting baskets. He's having a great time in Puerto Rico. I almost had a heart attack uh, when he sent me this. I, uh, I called him immediately, and I, was, I, I, I said, you have to stop. Uh, you know, I know that this feels good, and this feels great and everything, but this really isn't healed. So lest anybody think that this is the normal post-operative uh, protocol for this procedure, it isn't. But I think it does speak to the fact that it, it's, it's a remarkable return to muscular function. Uh, the proprioception may not be lost. You have a better sense of where you are. You have more control of your body. Um, and, and you just don't have that graft morbidity. Um, so I think over time, we will probably find that there are certain patients that we do this on that are able to progress faster. Uh, but I'm not quite there yet psychologically. So. Uh, after I had my mini heart attack, uh, we had a nice discussion, and uh, he's back on track with the rehab protocol. But this is this I, I can't remember the last patient I had six weeks after a reconstruction that is moving like this. And then the last 
this is sort of a, another, this is a 13 year old that I uh, performed the bear on. And why I bring this x-ray up is that this is what it looks like post-operatively. There's two little buttons on the femur and the tibia that are holding the sutures attached to the ACL inside the knee here. Um, but what I liked about this particular case is he's 13, his growth plates, they're not completely open, but they're still open to some degree, both here and here. And what the bare implant allows me to do is I can, I can sneak the graft or the tunnel for the sutures below the physis or below the growth plate, avoid damaging the edge of the growth plate here, which it, it happens you know, somewhat frequently with, with a traditional ACL reconstruction. And because the, the tunnel for the sutures is only four and a half millimeters, I can place it in multiple areas on the femur by altering my angle of approach and avoid the physis entirely. This, this provides a tremendous option for pediatric patients. This is, uh, this is, this is you know, game changing. I, I don't know, you know if anybody uh, in the audience has had any young athletes that have had this injury, but many years ago, the answer was, you know, let's just wait till he's skeletally mature. Let's put him in or her in a brace and let's wait until they're skeletally mature because we don't want to damage the growth plate. Then it became, well, we can do these extra physio reconstructions that are somewhat non-anatomic. And then you know what? If it fails after a couple of years, they'll be skeletally mature. We'll do a regular reconstruction. To me, that's not a great option. You know, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't sound like a great option. If we, could, if we could get a repair and get 80 to 85% or 90% of these to heal and restore stability without damaging the growth plate, this is a home run. So what do the results say? What do the studies show? Well, the thing is, is that there are a lot of studies, 35 preclinical studies, two uh, additional studies enrolling patients now. There's a bunch of animal basic science research. This is not something that is a, uh, hey, let's try this and see if it works on patients. This went through a rigorous uh, basic science and preclinical uh, trial that required FDA approval. The results were good enough that the FDA felt it was able to approve this, uh, this technique, this implant, and this procedure. Um, it was extensively studied. The, uh, the orthopedic surgeon, Martha Murray, who, who really put this together, was, uh, was, has been working on this for, for close to 20 years. And uh, the science is there, the research is there. Um, more research is needed because as time goes on, we're gonna refine this technique, we're gonna refine who the best patients are, and the success is gonna get even better. There's a registry for the bare implant. 30 sites are enrolling people now to be included in a multi-center registry that looks at a bunch of different factors, including OR time, is it faster? Is the patient under anesthesia uh, less? Is there less pain post-operatively? Do they need fewer or no narcotics at all? Um, one interesting thing is they're looking at the rate of contralateral tears. How many people injure their other knee, which is a very common uh, thing in, uh, in ACL injuries. 11, 12, 15% of patients go on to tear their other ACL. How do they, do they need more surgeries? How are they compliant with physical therapy? And, and really the biggest thing is, are they happy? Did their quality of life improve? Do they return to normal activities and sports? All these things are going to be coming down the pipe with greater, uh, greater data. So in the initial level one trial, um, at two years post-op, what, what was seen was that there were equivalent outcomes between the bare implant and the ACL reconstruction technique in terms of knee laxity. Laxity was restored uh, to an equivalent degree as it was with the ACL reconstruction and patient reported scores or outcomes were equivalent. What's interesting is the bear was rated superior in a couple of areas, including hamstring strength. This goes back to what we were talking about before. You don't have to take a graft. You don't have to remove a tendon. Uh, that's never going to grow back. That's never going to be replaced. You're gonna have better hamstring strength uh, up to two years early and up to two years uh, following the reconstruction. So this isn't something that, yeah, you know, it's weaker in the beginning, but it gets better over time. It seems like the bare uh, patients have better strength up to two years. There's improved knee osteoarthritis outcome scoring at 12 months. And interestingly, this is it right here. Four times 
uh, the number of bear patients felt confident in their knee at six months compared to the ACL reconstruction. And this is the same as what we saw in my patient at six weeks. They felt well enough to go out and participate in activities, even if we don't want them to go crazy in the beginning, they do feel more confident. And this speaks to the idea of the proprioception and muscle strength. Additionally, there was a two and a half times trend towards lower tear rates in the other knee. How could that be, right? We didn't do anything to the other knee. We didn't operate on the other knee, but yet two and a half times lower rate of tearing the other knee compared to ACL reconstructions. Lower risk of arthritis, at least in animal studies, proprioception seems to be the thing. There is a certain amount of injury that occurs on the other side of the body when you're not quite functioning the same as you would from injury on the other knee. And the real big thing is that the technique doesn't burn any bridges. And what I mean by that is if there is a failure, if the person does not heal the ACL or they re-tear it sometime down the road, their revision reconstruction or their reconstruction is, has the same outcomes as a primary ACL reconstruction. And that is just not the case with a, with a revision ACL reconstruction. Once, once the ACL is reconstructed and there's a failure, all revision studies tend to show results, less, lesser results than they did in the primary. So while, again, I bring up the pediatric patient, if we have a pediatric patient that has restored stability for two to three years from a bare implant, has intact proprioception, lower risk of arthritis during those three years, but then goes on to tear it again, they can still have the ACL reconstruction when their growth plates are closed and still achieve the same outcomes. To me, this is a much better option in a pediatric patient than putting them in a brace and hoping for the best or putting them in a brace and telling them not to participate until they're fully grown. It, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So my patient selection is basically the same as for an ACL reconstruction. Uh, you know, young athletes, older athletes, uh, uh, older patients who are recreationally active or just, or just hard workers who want stability of their knee. Um, you know, the only, the only difference is that I do look at their MRI and if I feel that the ligament doesn't have a decent amount of tissue, I uh, would usually opt for a reconstruction um, but that decision can also be made at the time of surgery. I'm prepared to do both. Uh, the, the, the second biggest thing is timing. Uh, these really need to be done within 50 days, 45 to 50 days. The biology is better for healing. So that's important for any of our uh, athletic trainers, coaches, parents, uh, referring doctors. If you have a patient that you think has an ACL tear that you think might want to have the option of a, of a repair versus a reconstruction, we need to get the MRI soon. Uh, we need to have the information as soon as we can, send them to the office, we'll take care of it, um, and we can decide whether, <clears throat> whether or not uh, they're a candidate for the procedure and make the decision after that. Trying physical therapy for a month to see if they get better and then getting the MRI will kind of push some people out of the, uh, the possibility. The FDA has not approved the bare implant, to my knowledge, beyond 45 or 50 days. So timing is really important here. A little bit about the physical therapy protocol. It's different. It's not the same. It's slower. There's partial weight bearing for a longer period of time. I, you know, admittedly, I bet my ACL reconstructions bear weight as soon as they feel comfortable. Can't, we, we don't do that with the, uh, with the bare implant. We give them a little bit more time with partial weight bearing. We limit their range of motion a little bit longer to protect the suture repair uh, and not put too much tension on it. Um, we do let, let them do strengthening and gentle exercises. Um, but at the end of the day, the physical therapy protocol, the return to play it is basically the same as for an ACL reconstruction. I know that there was some feeling that maybe we can get people on the field faster. Uh, not sure yet. I'm being cautious. I'm treating them the same as my ACL reconstructions. Um, tend to let them go go back to pivoting or high contact sports at nine months. And if they're a uh, you know a lesser contact, lower pivoting type activity like our javelin thrower, I might let them go back a little sooner. So why why the bear? Why why are we doing this? My opinion: anatomy preservation. Um, you know, I always felt that 
if we could save your anatomy, re reconstruct what you have, not, you know, restore what you could have, uh, what you have without reconstructing it or, uh, you know, altering the anatomy, it's always a good thing. The re restoration of the ligament and appropriate septic properties was sort of a surprise finding, um, but I think that makes a lot of sense and it's, it's pretty uh, borne out in the uh, research. Eliminate donor graft morbidity, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, you know, you can't get around the weakness and the pain and the potential complications from taking a graft from somewhere else. Uh, you take that piece of tissue out, you're never getting it back. There's pain, there's weakness, and technically, sometimes there's a poor fit. Sometimes the graft is too small, particularly with the hamstrings, and you have to augment it. And then sometimes the graft is too big. Uh, the patient's anatomy, you have a, a young woman who's like maybe 14 that has an ACL reconstruction, you put a 10 millimeter bone patellar bone graft in there and it stuffs, it stuffs the notch. I mean, her notch is only so big. Uh, you know, there's a difference. The, the graft is the same size, whether you're, you know, four foot 11 or, or six foot 11. And the size and the area available for the graft to fit is a lot less than those smaller, smaller patients. When you repair the, uh, the ACL, you know, you don't have to worry about that. And the revision is easier. Um, like I said earlier, the, uh, the outcomes from a revision seem to be the same as a primary ACL reconstruction. There's no burning of bridges. Um, arthritis might be less over time. We're still learning, but that definitely looks like that's a possibility. And again, the pediatric ACL. Um, big benefits here, in my opinion. Avoid the growth plate, smaller drill holes. Give them a chance to heal without worrying about damaging their growth plate. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rizzio. That was really, really um, interesting. I love the video footage and uh, showing some of your good results from, from the bear. Um, I, I just want to mention for anyone that wants to drop in a question, please drop it in our Q&A. Uh, it should be at the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I, I wanted to give the, you and the panel an opportunity to maybe discuss some of the cases you reviewed from here. Lou, that was an excellent presentation. I mean, it was very complete and I enjoyed it. My question that I have is, um, you talked about how you, how you, can, you make a decision at the time of surgery, and I'm sure you discussed that with the patient beforehand, but I know in my experience, sometimes when you give, when you talk about things like that, like we could do this in the surgery, we can do that, sometimes the patients get the feeling like, well, I don't think he knows what he's doing. I may go somewhere else. So how, how do you present that to the patient? Um, I, I really, so yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I know that sometimes there's a, uh, there's a sense, uh, people want a definite answer, yes or no, right? Um, my approach to practice has always been one of, uh, you know, honesty and open communication. And I think when I explain it to the, to the patient that there are technical aspects of a procedure that, um, no MRI or no physical exam will allow me to, uh, to decide until I actually feel the tissue. Um, and I and I explain it to them that if I feel that the, you know, my in my best opinion at the time of surgery, if the procedure is not going to not going to have a high success rate, I'm going to switch to something else. They're generally appreciative of the honesty. I think they uh, they can understand it. Sometimes it takes a little bit more uh, talking and discourse back and forth, questions and answers on both sides to really understand each other. But at the end of the day. Um, you know, that has not, that has not, not been a big problem for me. Lou, that was a excellent presentation. Just so informative. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I had a quick question and I know that there's that 50 day time window. D do you think um, that that's more just, Hey, this is what we have regarding our study more FDA related, or do you think there's any biological reasons why you have to do within the 50 days or do you think this is going to probably open up to months down the road in the future? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, right? So because uh, that is a big question, why can't I get this now instead of then? And and I do think that there's a biological component. Um, you know, the more time, the more time that the uh, torn ends of the ACL sit in that synovial fluid without having a repair, the more time there is for uh, uh, sort of like a, a resorption and regener uh, a degeneration of the ends of the fibers. Um, I've seen this, and, and Pete can tell you too, is 
I've seen this in my in my patients years ago when someone comes in that has uh, had an unreconstructed ACL uh, like a year ago or two years a two years old injury. Sometimes you go in and there's, there's really like where did the ligament go? You know what what happened to the ligament? There's nothing left. And the body seems to resorb the ends of the ligament. The, the synovial fluid does have a negative effect uh, on that. And I do, I do think there's a biologic component to it. However, um, I do think that there are going to be certain patients that may still be a candidate for this procedure longer out after, uh, after the tear. And that, again, is based on my, uh, my experience looking at these at surgery. I see, sometimes see people six months after an ACL uh, tear and you go in and the, the ligament looks like almost normal, except for the fact that it's not attached. And, you know, so certain tears, I think, may be amenable to a longer repair. But right now, the biology of the situation uh, kind of prevents us from uh, from performing the procedure any later than that. Great. Thanks, Lou. I and really briefly I had a question for Matt. And uh, Matt, I was hoping to get your expertise on what your um what your um I know how things were from a rehab and if if it was any you know considerably different oh. can you hear me? I think uh you froze, but um, okay. So, <laughs> oh um so yeah, so from a rehab perspective, it was uh, different, a little conservative on the front end, but overall, you know, we're still looking at that same window of eight to nine months um, before return to activity. It's just um, a little slow to get started, just being cautious, right? So um, we were, we, we saw uh, maybe return to running around month five for us, which is, you know, maybe a month, a month later than normal, usually with the reconstructions, we're, we're, we're back to running around four month four, but one of the issues that, that you're going to encounter with that and doc touched on it is that you need, you need somebody, they're going to feel great, you know, maybe weeks, week six, even, or even earlier than that. And um, the mental toughness and the discipline to kind of stay on the protocol and not kind of veer off the path. You know, you know, we, we, we see this a lot, <laughs> you know, everybody sees it. You have these young kids, you have these active college kids. They want to get out there. They want to play, pick up basketball. They want to wrestle with their friends and they just can't, uh, you know, really can't do that. You don't want to, you don't want to take any unnecessary risks um, jeopardizing the rehab um, in the early phases. So, so, but like Doc had touched on um, the comfort level post-surgery was like remarkable, you know, compared to some, some of the reconstructions, there wasn't a lot of swelling. There wasn't a lot of pain. There wasn't obviously really um, wound recovery that we had to worry about or scarring or anything like that. So it was it was great from that perspective. Dr. Rizzio, uh, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, if you, I can queue them up for you if you'd like. Um, yeah. Our first, our first question here uh, from Catherine Hanlon. Uh, has the increased incidence of ACL injury been improved with sport specific training and conditioning? So, so yeah, so I mean, it's, it, it, it's a pretty well established uh, thing that if you were to do a certain number of uh, pre-season, in-season and after season <coughs> uh, uh, agility and strength training protocols, you can decrease the incidence of ACL tears. Um, that is, that is a, a pretty good study from many years ago. Uh, so that definitely helps improve uh, improve the incidence. So when we work with, you know, when I work with NJIT and the other athletic trainers in the schools and the teams that I've worked with, we try to, you know, get the get the strength and conditioning coaches and the uh, coaches themselves on board with including these types of exercises in their routine because it clearly d diminishes the uh, the incidence of ACL tears and it's particularly effective in our female athletes who have a much higher ACL tear rate than men. Thank you. Dr. DeLuca, anything to add to that? No, I think, uh, I mean, Lou's right. All the studies from uh, that, that show about these uh, PEP and all these programs that are to prevent ACLs have definitely been shown in literature to decrease the incidence of ACL tears. So I think it's important that uh, coaches and athletic trainers push their athletes to participate in these programs uh, before practices. It only takes about 15 minutes and they can dramatically decrease the incidence of ACL tears. 
Great. Uh, next question was um, specifically, Dr. Rizzio, what are your thoughts on the timing and use of blood flow restriction uh, therapy during the rehabilitation process after bear? I don't know if we have any literature on that yet or any research. Yeah, no, I'm not, I, I think this is, uh, you know, this is way too, uh, way too new uh, to have any of that data out there. I mean, um, I, off the top of my head, sort of, I don't have, um, I don't have any negative thoughts about it. Um, you know, I think what I think what's most important about uh, the rehab protocol is making sure that we're avoiding stressing the repair uh, with pivoting type activities. You know, uh, aggressive plyometrics and putting people at risk in in in, uh, in conditioning activities like jumping and side to side movements and things like that. Um, so, you know, this this doesn't seem, in my mind, wouldn't cause that problem. So. Uh, superficially, I have no, I have no issues with it, but there's no data on it. I can uh, jump in here, Doc, because we did do a little bit of uh, blood flow restriction with um, our javelin thrower at NJIT. That was probably, you know, we're talking September, October. So that was like month five, month six, um, right as they're getting into the higher level uh, rehab, right? So they're starting to do some plyos, they're starting to get into some cutting, and we need to you know, we've had a lag and maybe being able to build a lot of muscle. So we're, we were, the goal was to, you know, maybe accelerate muscle building in the quad right around month five or six. And we had success with it. We didn't have any issues. Um, patients tolerated it well. And, uh, you know, just, just chugging, chugging along. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've well, had a lot of experience with blood flow restriction and we use a lot with the professional athletes um, and I, it's really great. I mean, I think it uh, helps a lot because you're, you're not putting stress on the joints. You're not stressing the ACL in this case, but yet you're getting good uh, muscle strength in your quads, uh, hamstrings by minimal exercising. Uh, you have, you have uh, growth hormone that's produced because of the BFR. And I know some surgeons are worried that um, with big incisions, they don't want to do it too soon because they think it might affect some of the skin healing. But with this procedure, with minimal skin incisions, I think it's fine. And you're not affecting the arterial blood flow, so you're not going to affect the blood flow to the healing ligament itself. So I think it would be an excellent adjunct to, uh, to rehab. Yeah, we're, we're, def we're definitely learning some. Uh, we're, we're learning as this process goes on. And as I'm getting more comfortable with the, with the recovery and what happens, I think I'm, I'm getting less. Uh, restrictive on some of the earlier activities, but uh, you know, it is a process, a learning process. As I hear you guys all talking, I keep thinking research paper. <laughs> the more I hear you guys all, all chiming in here. Um, so next question, Dr. Epstein uh, threw out one for us. Commonly people wait a few weeks for swelling to resolve before you perform a BPB reconstruction. How early do you try bear? Do you wait a few weeks or will you do it ASAP, for example? Uh, do you wait for the swelling to decrease? Yeah, so uh, I have, uh, I, there's no, there does not seem to be any reason to uh, wait for the swelling to decrease um, with these. Um, I, the, the, the initial thought about waiting for the swelling to decrease um, and uh, with a reconstruction is because there's, there's a bit of a higher incidence of stiffness postoperatively in patients who have a reconstruction that, done, that get done very early due to the swelling the, the pain and the excessive scar tissue formation. But the feeling is, is that one, as Dr. Krasofia brought up, the biology is better when we get to it faster. Uh, number two, we're not doing that reconstruction. We're not causing the morbidity and the extra pain from the graft. Uh, so we're not seeing that same level of, uh, of stiffness uh, concern with an earlier, uh, an earlier repair. Okay, thank you. A um, couple more questions here. We have a few minutes, so I think we could take them all. Um, from Berta Carmo, would BFR still be a good intervention with this type of surgery as compared to other surgical techniques? Are we, or do we already address that pretty much? Yeah, I, I think it has a benefit, um, and I don't see any downside to doing it. And a couple questions in here from Eric Altair. Um, how long is the patient in the operating room for typically? Uh, it depends, you know, on uh, just like anything else, some, uh, some procedures move a little faster than others. But in general, I've been able to uh, have this uh, repair done in uh, 90 minutes or less. 
And then um, one of our other athletic trainers here, Jean, um, if you re-tear, can you have another bear implant? So that doesn't seem to be uh, a possibility. Um, maybe over time uh, there'll be some changes, but I, I don't think that that's going to work out. And predominantly the, the reason there is that uh, you know, it's, uh, you're not going to have the same quality of tissue. You need to have a certain level of tissue quality to hold the sutures in order to have a successful reconstruction. Uh, so at the current time, I don't think that's a possibility. And one question for myself, because I know we have some pediatricians on, on today's attendee list. Um, what is the youngest that the bear is FDA approved for at this point? What's the youngest age you can do it? Yeah, so I think that the FDA approval is, uh, I, I have to be honest, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's somewhere in the 13-year-old uh, the range. Um, okay. I don't think younger than that, the FDA approval, um, but I also believe that that is, uh, that is getting a little bit um, less strict because there doesn't seem to be any, there, there's like no, what is, the, uh, what, is the, what is the risk to a person who's 11 versus 13 from the bare implant? And I can't think of any because it's not that the bare implant's a, uh, a medical, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a chemical that we're introducing. We're not delivering a medication that may have an adverse effect in someone's system who's younger than older. Um, I think that was just the initial FDA approval out of caution, but I do believe that is, uh, that is opening up a bit. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our panelists for, for joining us today. I think this was really informative and it seems like we got a lot of folks engaged in the topic. So thank you, Dr. Rizzio, for leading the charge today. You did a great job. Um, Dr. Christofiak, if you want to just close us out for, for this morning, that would be great. Awesome. Um, Lou, thanks again. It was an amazing presentation, very informative. Uh, it's great to see so many attendees on today. Um, you know, everyone who's who stayed on, you know, will get your CEUs credit, so don't worry about that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for one of our Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, look out for correspondence on the web or email for upcoming uh, lecture series and Grand Rounds, as well as our big sports medicine symposium uh, scheduled for October of this year. Again, thank you to everyone joining us, all of our partners, and uh, have a great weekend coming up. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for all our attendees. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I'm on my way to do another bear today. <laughs> so good luck. Bye-bye. Awesome. All right. Bye. Bye. Have a good day.